Thank you for this kind invitation and the opportunity <clears throat> to discuss MBA programs and the future of management development in India. Um, and uh, and welcome to all the deans. I can't imagine all these deans in one room, but uh, welcome to all of you. Um, we're talking about effective MBA faculty for 21st century management education. Um, I don't think the problem is any different in the 20th century because I don't think people ever got the message of what the problems of MBA education were. They were the same in the 20th century as I conceive that they are in the 21st century. So it's not as if this is new. The problem is not different. The problem is in the word management um, because we don't have management education in most MBA programs. We have business education um, and business education is fine. Um, it teaches people how to be experts or specialists in finance, in marketing, in consumer behavior, uh, in human resource management, and so on. That's fine. The problem is management education because MBA programs don't have much management education uh, or any uh, in many cases. Um, you can't create a manager in a classroom. If you have a classroom of people who are not managers, forget it. You're not doing management education. And if you try and do management education, it's worse because you distort people's perception of management. You can't understand management by being lectured at or reading books about management. You have to start understanding management by being a manager, which means that if you want to have management education, you've got to fill your classes with managers who, who can get educated. Um, uh, I wrote in my book, Managers Not MBAs, in 2006, um, that MBA programs train the wrong people in the wrong ways with the wrong consequences. And what I mean is that the people are not managers and therefore cannot become managers. Um, and, and I'll get to the ways in a minute, but the consequences are that they too often distort the practice of management. And let me just give you some examples. I have a website, uh, minsberg.org slash blog, um, not a website, but a, but a blog site, um, also a website. and. Um, and in it, I published a blog some time ago uh, about um, the fact that CEOs uh, don't perform very well as MBAs. If you look up uh, uh, CEOs as MBAs um, or MBAs as CEOs, I can't remember, um, the data is kind of shocking. Uh, one study we did of Harvard superstars as of some years ago, uh, the most famous Harvard graduates as chief executives, 10 out of the 19 were failures and four were questionable. And then there were other studies that we cite where people who have MBAs who end up as chief executives tend to do worse than ones who don't and get paid more. So they certainly know that aspect. So th those are the consequences, but let me, let me talk about the ways. Management, if you imagine a triangle, art, craft, science, uh, management is a practice that takes place in that triangle between art, creativity, insight, vision, all those things, craft meaning experience-based, and science meaning analysis-based, and effective managers, management combines those. You can't teach art in a management classroom, no matter who's in that classroom, you can't teach art. You can, you can teach the craft in the sense that you can enhance the experience of people who have experience. Most, most uh, MBA students don't have that experience. And so what MBA programs tend to do is concentrate on the science, namely analysis. And that's fine. Um, as I said, if it's for training in specialized jobs and not training in management itself. Um, so, so, so there's a distortion that leads to the consequences I talked about a moment ago. Um, now, um, just looking at my notes. Um, so management is not a science. It is, it, is, it is not a profession, it's a practice. Um, and so the craft is the most important part. We have to teach the science, the analysis, and we have to encourage the art in entrepreneurs and so on. Um, but, but the key for education is craft. And craft is experience-based 
and that means you need people with experience. So we've created programs, for example, once called the International Masters in Practicing, Ma Inter well, we call it now the International Masters for Managers, one is the International Masters for Health Leadership, and what we do is we bring in people with experience and we build on that experience in the classroom. So instead of discussing cases, which are other people's experience and disconnected, we enhance people's uh, facility to reflect on their own experience and learn from their own experience. And that's what makes, uh, what makes the classroom so powerful. It's quite amazing when you have 30 or 40 experienced managers conversing among themselves based on the theory and other things that we introduce, but building on their own concerns, their own issues they're facing. We do things like friendly consulting so they can help to learn from each other and so on and so forth. And that, and that works really powerfully. So we can have management education if we have managers in the classroom. Um, the second question I've asked to address is the role of faculty, and I think the word grounded is the most important word. The teaching has to be grounded, and the research has to be grounded. Frankly, when I look at the journals, most of the journal articles I see today are either incomprehensible to me or convoluted or simply so disconnected that managers can't relate to it at all. And if we're not speaking to managers with our research, who are we speaking to? And, and the answer is quite clear, we're speaking to each other. We have no business speaking to each other. Society is paying us in one way or another as professors to speak to our, our clientele, if you like. I don't mean consulting, I mean speaking to people in management to enhance their understanding and their capability of practicing. Management. I went to a conference years ago on leadership. It's being held regularly at Southern Illinois, I think it was university. Um, and, um, and I was asked to comment on the papers. And I was so shocked uh, by these leadership papers, which had nothing to do with leadership as I knew it, that a couple of my friends who were concerned about leadership working in the National Film Board of Canada, I asked them to look at the papers. And they were shocked by what was going on. These are two smart, intelligent people who couldn't comprehend what in the world these people were talking about. If we can't speak to intelligent, thoughtful managers, there are all kinds of managers, but if we can't speak to intelligent, thoughtful managers, we are failing. And so the faculty has to root its research. It has to root its teaching, and that's basically what I talked about a few minutes ago, rooting their teaching means connecting to management practice and being able to present theory and techniques and everything we do to people in practice. If they don't understand it or they don't like it, we're failing, not them. Um, on the other hand, if we have things to say to them, uh, then, uh, then they'll run with it. So we have people sitting in round tables in a flat classroom so they can break out and discuss everything in groups. If I do a little lecture on the fact that most strategies are not deliberate, they're not developed in a planning process, but they develop through a learning process that I call emergent strategy. And if I present that and then say, okay, discuss how that works in your company, especially when people come in groups from their company and they can discuss together how this works for their company. Um, and when people have that opportunity, um, it's, it's mind opening. It's, it's, it's not because the theories are so brilliant, it's because it gives them a chance to say, okay, here's a professor with an idea. Now, how can I use that idea in my own practice? So our real connection in the classroom is not to professors, to, uh, sorry, to theory itself or to cases itself, but to their own experience. And reflection is the key word. How can they reflect on their own experience? Okay. Um, uh, that's all I want, wanted to say about the second question, the role of faculty. And the third question is, what's my message to faculty and deans in India? Well, I am to be a fan of Indian intellectual thought. I am amazed at how many brilliant, absolutely brilliant people I meet from India. I'm not talking about everybody, and I'm not talking about 
everybody I meet who's, who's driving a, an auto rickshaw or whatever. I'm just talking about people I bump into who are amazingly thoughtful. I used to think the British were the most interesting in a way because the British will come out with really stunning ideas, some of them will always come out with, you know, if I have a group of 10, there's two or three who are going to come out with really terrific, interesting ideas. But the Indians have an advantage. The great Indians, the really good thinking Indians, have an advantage over even the Brits, I think, and that is they're synthesizers. They put things together. They understand things in totality. And that is such a welcome thing. I, I've had Indian friends ever since I went to university. There was an Indian guy doing engineering with me. We were big buddies. And all my life, I've had close Indian friends. Probably my closest was Samantha Goshal, who died sadly some years ago before he could do so much of his brilliant work. But co my conversations with Samantha were just unmet by anybody else. They were wonderful, wonderful conversations. He had that playfulness and that depth and that ability to synthesize. So if you want to know what Indian deans and Indian professors can do, they can use that amazing capability, the ones who can do it, and so many of them are able to do it. Look at all the gurus who turn out to be Indians. I, <laughs> I don't mean Indian gurus, I mean management gurus. Obviously, a lot of gurus in India, but I mean management gurus. Look at the look at how many of them are are are, are Indian, uh, far more than American or British or what have you. They're the really great ones. Um, so what can Indian deans and and professors can do? They can they can stimulate uh, that kind of thinking as applied to all our problems, including our global problems of warming and everything else, um, but also our problems of of approaching management education. Uh, my concern is there probably hasn't been enough addressing. The Brits have done more to address management education, maybe than the Indians uh, and certainly the Americans have, uh, at least in academia. The Americans in corporations do better. But, uh, but uh, it's time for India to address this issue. So I welcome the conference. I welcome this invitation. Thank you.